Joe um, works at the Spanish State School as part of a bilingual program where she's teaching science, arts, craft, and of course, English in lower primary. And as the father of a six-year-old, you have my undying respects for dealing with big groups of uh, that age group. Joe is also one of our fantastic authors, and she's written lots of course books, including um, Give Me Five, and as I mentioned earlier, has also agreed to put together uh, a series of Give Me Five Top Tips uh, uh, videos. So today, Joe is going to answer all your questions about how we teach young learners online. So Joe, over to you. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, well, it's lovely to be here again um, today, and it's fantastic to see so many of you. I've just been looking at all different countries that you're all from, and it's amazing to see so many here. And many of us have found ourselves, though, in a situation where we are no longer teaching children face to face. We're having to teach remotely using a variety of different platforms like Google Meet or Zoom. And this sudden change has been a challenge for teachers and children alike. We may have many years of experience of teaching young learners face to face, but we may be less familiar with how to teach online. Some of our more active classroom methodologies, such as cooperative learning, pair work and group work, it's difficult to adapt to our new situation. And although there is a vast array of different technology and a variety of different apps out there, much of it is accessible to children who are more independent, children who are now reading to learn rather than learning to read. So we find that we need to reach a little further down into our tool bag and pull out some of the skills that we already have and that can, just with a little adjustment, work very well in an online environment. My own first attempts at online teaching focused mainly on making sure that everybody was okay. Being able to see each other after almost a week and making sure that everybody felt comfortable and at ease with this new way of communicating. Even now, after almost two months of online classes, there are still one or two pupils who prefer to participate with the camera off and one who is more comfortable writing answers on a piece of paper rather than participating orally. So for me, teaching this age group online is about keeping in touch, not losing that contact with English. We are moving forward with the curriculum, but more slowly and with hand-picked content that adapts well to this novel situation. So the ideas that I've chosen to talk about today are those which I think help children to feel comfortable enough to participate and join in with us in our virtual lessons. I'm going to focus on using the environment around us, how to use the fact that the children are at home to our advantage. I'll be looking at ways of increasing participation we need the children to join in actively with our lessons and not just sit there as if they were in front of a television or a cinema. I'll be suggesting some games that I feel work best and a few suggestions for class management. And then at the end, there'll be a chance for you to ask questions in the Q&A section and I'll try to answer them all. So, the first thing that I did when being presented with this whole online challenge was to swap my units around. In science, the next unit that I was supposed to teach was the sun and the moon. So I swapped it for materials. And in English, instead of finishing the topic about the neighbourhood, we moved straight on to the next unit, which was clothes. The reason being, was that the children have got easy access to different clothes 
and they've got lots of things around them made of different materials that they can touch and investigate. And in this way, we could use the children's home to personalize our lessons and to connect with our pupils in a way that creates opportunity for real communication as well. One idea for using the children's home environment is to play show me something. Ask students to find things in their homes that represent what it is that you're teaching. Make sure that you've got some examples of your own at hand to give visual support if needed. In my materials unit, I introduced six different materials and then I asked them to go off and find something made of each one. This is made of wood. Can you show me something made of wood? They then touch and experiment with each object to find out its different properties. Is it hard or soft? Is it smooth or rough? Etc. Use the same game to review colours by saying, show me something green, show me something red. Allow time for children to look around and pick up an item before moving on to the next colour. With preschool children, give them an example first. This is yellow. Can you show me something yellow? It's a good idea to tell parents what you will be doing in the lesson so they can gather a few different items and maybe put them in a box nearby. Or you can just get used to the idea that they will disappear for a while. You can see in the photo here that I've lost a couple in their hunt for green items. You can review shapes, toys and different concepts as well. Uh, things that are natural or man-made around them, things that are big or small, things that are long or short. And for slightly older children, instead of naming the items directly, you can give clues to encourage thinking skills. Show me something you can eat or show me something you can read. Show me something that can fly. Maybe they've got a toy plane or some kind of plastic bird or insect that they can show you. Probably the best thing about remote teaching for me has been asking the children to send me little videos. In our science sessions, we've done all sorts of experiments. I usually do the experiment myself first, before the session and video it. And then in the online session, I show them the video to demonstrate the concepts. Then I do the experiment again, live. And we all go through the stages together, predicting, observing. We discuss the results and then I note the results down on a PowerPoint slide. Children have a page in their book where they would normally note down results after doing the experiment in class. But now they all do the experiment at home. Mum and Dad video the experiment and they send me through the video. It's been really interesting to see the progression of these videos over the last two months. The first videos were just pointing things out. We started simple with things around the home that are natural or man-made. Children pointed out their brothers and sisters this is natural, they're pets. They went out onto their balconies and pointed out lots of things in the environment around them. Then we moved on to things made of different materials. They went into the kitchen. They showed us things made of glass, wood and metal. But for the experiments, what I found now is that we've got some budding YouTube stars. They've put special effects, there's music, I've asked for permission from the parents to show you one of the examples of one of the experiments. So if you just bear with me, I'm going to close the presentation and open up the video. Yeah. 
I'm, I am going to stop that there. She um, she does go on to investigate all of the six items and I for one could watch her all day, but um, we need to move on and let me find my presentation once again, if you just bear with me, it's here. Oh, there we go. The other thing about the videos for me has been watching how some really shy children really come out of their shells when interacting with a parent, producing more language than they would even normally in the classroom. The videos are also ideal for assessment. Parents send the videos privately via WhatsApp so for assessment i've got everybody's video all together for each child so which makes it easier for me to see the progression and i can also give direct feedback to each parent about the children and about the the videos another thing that we can do is a game to play to take advantage of the home environment and that's the mirror me game Ask the children to bring some of their toys to the online lesson. Use these toys to practice prepositions of place by mirroring what you're doing with one of their own toys or by following instructions that you give. The ball is next to the car or put the ball between the car and the bear. You could ask them to use any different items, maybe transport they might have had, uh, lying around animals, dolls to practice he and she or classroom objects. After giving your own examples, some of the more confident children could take over and give instructions as well. We can also practice prepositions by playing hide and seek. During the online lesson, you can quickly switch off your camera and hide an object. You need to make sure that it's within the range of the camera so that the children can find it. Have the children take turns to try and find it. Is it in the bag? Is it behind the car? Obviously do a better job of hiding the bear than, than I've done. That was just so that you could see. Once the children have discovered the hiding place, allow the winner to hide an object of their own. Remind them to switch off the camera while they do so. Show and tell is another activity that children find really motivating. They can show you their pet or a favourite toy and describe it. I ask children to make robots out of recycled materials for the art class. And in the following session, they brought their robots to the lesson and talked about them. Again, I'm going to show you a short clip of Paula showing us her robot and telling us all about it. This is made of paper. This is major wood. This is major plastic. This this is metal plastic. And this is metal plastic. And ice is metal plastic. That's fantastic. Well 
so there we could see Paula demonstrating and showing us her her robot that she made together with her parents. I'll just pull back the presentation. With this type of activity, uh, participation is high. Everyone wanted to show their robot and tell us all about it, which brings me to the next point, how to increase participation online. At the beginning of the session, I talked briefly about helping children to feel comfortable. Tracy Chapleton gave a really interesting webinar for the British Council at the end of March, where she told us, anxious children don't learn. And that for me is key. In the classroom, it's easy to make everyone feel comfortable. We smile encouragingly at each child and our eye contact with each one makes them feel included. Online, it's difficult for children to feel that personal connection. We could be looking at anybody. So I try to use children's names as much as possible. Greet everyone personally as they arrive using their name and ask them how they're feeling. We always sing a little song at the beginning to talk about our feelings and to review different types of feelings. Today is Wednesday and we are angry. Today is Wednesday and we are bored. Today is Wednesday and we are happy. After that, I ask them how they're feeling. Letting them answer individually makes them feel included and involved. So again, I want to just show you a short clip to give you the idea. You can see the children talking about their feelings. feel excited oh good who else wants to tell us how do you feel today is that good job who else samuel I feel you feel excited as well what about you lucia lucia berenguer You feel angry. I'll just pull up my presentation again. If they say that they feel angry or bored, try to make sure that they're included in the following activities. So sometimes positive reinforcement helps them to get uh, back on track and it can help them to, to change their mood. Uh, if they've answered a question correctly, include their name in the praise. Try to name everyone at some point during the session if you can. Singing songs also encourages everyone to join in. Action songs are the best. Even with microphones on mute, we can still see that children are joining in and enjoying themselves. I'm going to show you another short clip where you can see children joining in with the Days of the Week song. We always start this song by holding up seven fingers. So we can see that everybody is joining in, even though we won't be able to hear them. Uh, you will be able to tell me though, unfortunately. There are seven days, there are seven days, there are seven days in a week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Super! So we can see that everybody's involved, everybody's joining in. They're not just sitting there, they are actually participating. We can also encourage 
the participation in songs by congratulating those who you see are doing a good job and um, mouthing along with the words. Usually if there's a musical interlude in between verses, that's when I try to encourage everybody, good job now, well done. And, and then that encourages everybody to start to join in. Our classes are quite early in the morning. Some of the children have just got up. We're trying to fill them with a little bit of energy um, so they're not lethargic. A great song to sing with the children is Head, Shoulders, shoulders Knees and Toes. This is a perfect example of an action song that everyone can join in with. Ask the children to stand up. Make sure they've got enough space around them. Other great examples are, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. You can change some of the lyrics around to practice daily routine. If you're happy and you know it, wash your face, brush your teeth or comb your hair. One finger, one thumb, keep moving is also great. The wheels on the bus, even the hokey cokey. Any songs that children already know are ideal. I have found over this period that it's not so easy to learn new songs remotely, so I try to stick with songs that children already know. If we want children to produce language as well, Odd One Out is ideal for encoding thinking skills and production of longer sentences. Choose the concept or lexical set that you want to review. Choose three or four items. I've chosen three. Two items that go together and one from a different set. You can project a slide as I've done here, or you can use real objects or flashcards. Encourage children to participate. Ask them to raise their hand and then name the children. They can unmute the microphone. As you saw in the video earlier, when I was asking children how they felt today, each one was unmuting the microphone to participate and then muting again. Ask why is that the odd one out to encourage further production? It's the door because it's made of wood. Here in this short clip, Fran is going to tell us which is the odd one out between the park, the mountain and the seesaw. It's instructing me that the video hasn't been uploaded. But, um, well, instead of showing the, the video, I can just tell you that Fran did a great job of explaining what was the odd one out. Come in and say, this is the odd one out. And explain uh, because the um, slide was made, oh, the slide was, uh, the seesaw was a um, man-made object and the other objects were natural. So moving on then, another activity that can get everyone's attention is a drawn dictation. Select an item from the topic that you want to review and give short, simple instructions. You can review body parts by drawing a monster, draw a big head, draw three eyes, colour the eyes orange, etc. As children finish drawing each stage, ask them to hold up their paper to show you. If you're teaching science, you can review parts of a plant, parts of a house, or even a pizza or a healthy meal. You can follow yourself a step-by-step -step guide if you wish. There are lots of different things to draw in the Sparklebox website. You can see the instructions that I've, I've used here as an illustration. You can review numbers and colours by varying the quantity of items to be drawn and asking children to colour them. Make sure the instructions you give are short and items to draw are simple so that children can draw quickly and move on to the next stage without having to wait for everyone else to catch up. Another activity that gets everyone involved is origami. It's simple, it's fun. Children can participate and there's an end product. It also takes the pressure off learning or reviewing content and vocabulary and reinforces listening skills and comprehension. Use something that's a little bit more simple than you would do in the classroom, 
Remember that in class, you and other classmates are available to help. Parents may be on hand, but they may not, which could cause stress if someone got stuck and couldn't follow the instructions. Tell the children what you're going to make and show them an example. I usually show the example first so they know where we're going. Here you can see that we've made a paper hat and then we made a dog. And then demonstrate making the item slowly, step by step, while children watch before they join in with you. So you can see that we made a hat. The hat is very simple. You just need a piece of paper, fold the paper in half, corner to corner. Push and squash. Fold the paper in half again. Corner to corner. Push and squash. And now open. Fold one corner into the middle like a triangle. Like this. Push and squash. Fold the other corner into the middle like a triangle, like this. Push and squash. Now, look, there are two pieces. Fold up, like this. Turn it over, fold the other side up, like this. And here's your hat, put it on. And then all the children put the hat on. Obviously, with the children, we've gone much more slowly. Make sure that everybody is following the stages one by one. But that the hat is very simple. The dog is even more simple. You just need a square piece of paper, fold it into a triangle, fold the ears. And while people are still folding or making the square, others can be decorating by drawing the eyes and the nose on their dog. Once we got both things, we put them both together. You can also demonstrate something that then they can go away and do offline. We made the ocean in a box, which was very successful. And this kept everyone busy right at the start of the confinement period. Then we made windmills. I demonstrated online and left the instructions on my blog so that parents could help because uh, this is a little bit more complex. They had to put a pin in the middle, but everybody made um, a windmill. They all sent photos. They sent videos of blowing the, the windmills. Later on, we made robots from recycled materials, as you saw Paula describing her robot earlier on. Again, I demonstrated what to do um, and the children went away with their parents afterwards and made their own robots, which were far and away more fabulous than anything that I demonstrated or even anything that we could have done in the classroom with limited resources. In fact, you can see here that one of the robots is in fact wearing a mask. Making things has allowed children to pay attention for more extended periods of time. They're highly motivated by the end product, but in general, their attention span is quite short. It's even shorter online than it is in the classroom. So it's a good idea to change activities frequently and play lots of games. So I'm going to show you a very small selection of games that I found work quite well. I Spy. I Spy works very well. You can play I Spy to review any number of different lexical sets. Have all the objects or flashcards ready on the table in front of you. Make sure everyone can see them. It could be a collection of animals, um, plastic animals, toys, clothes, whatever lexical set you're working on. Or you can use some of the online videos that you can find uh, on YouTube. I spy with my little eye something beginning with A. 
you can see it's an apple. So the videos on YouTube have a wider variety of image. Just watch them through first and make sure that children know all the vocabulary before you use them. iSpy is also extremely adaptable. Instead of working on the initial letter of each item, we can think about what things are made of. I spy something made of plastic, a pen, for example. Or we can practice colours. I spy something green. Simon Says is also great as a warmer to grab everyone's attention or between activities to change focus. You can review parts of the body. Simon says, touch your nose, touch your ears. You can review action verbs that children learnt in class. Simon says, stand up, sit down or turn around. With my class, I just play a straightforward action game. I say the actions and children do them. So I'll just show you a short clip of children joining in with the action game. Swim. Fly. Brush your teeth. Wash your face. So you can use any of the action verbs that you've done, daily routine or um, any kind of actions, even actions that you would normally be doing in the classroom. Draw, colour, paint, uh, just to review and make sure that children don't forget these different things, even though they're not using them at the moment. The stand up, sit down game is also good for practicing closed questions. In this game, instead of answering verbally, children stand up for yes and sit down for no. As well as giving them the opportunity to move around, if they're unsure of an answer, they've got the visual support of their classmates to give them confidence. Make a statement. If it's true, children stand up. If it's false, they sit down. For example, cats can run. Well, that's true. So children stand up. Cats can fly. Children sit down. We can use this stand up, sit down game to review any science concepts. Fish live in the water. Yes, so they would stand up. Dolphins live on land. No, so then they would sit down. We can personalise by saying, stand up if it's true for you. Make a statement about yourself. I love chocolate. If that's true for you, stand up. One of my favourite activities in class is playing a classification game. And you can adapt this to play it online. Ask the children to make simple signs. You can see here, we've made little signs inland and coast, or wild and domestic animals, or food that comes from animals or plants. They can write each word on a piece of paper, maybe using a different color, or adding a simple illustration. My year one classes have been learning about geographical features that you can find at the coast or inland. I said the different items, I showed the image and they held up their sign. Cliff at the coast, a mountain, inland. This week we've been talking about recycling. I brought along all my rubbish and children helped me to put it into my plastic bags that I've got for recycling they showed different, they held up different colours of pens, crayons or anything they had. Glass goes in the green bin. Plastic goes in the yellow bin. They could participate if they want or just hold up the different crayons. What's missing is also ideal for reviewing any set of vocabulary. 
Lay out the items that you want children to review. Take one away and the children have to guess which one's missing. The advantage with this game online is that you don't have to trust the children. Um, my children are terrible cheaters and they pretend that they're covering their eyes and they're really not. With this time online, we can switch off our camera just for a second while we take the item away so there are no cheaters here. I've been using uh, Realia in my classes mainly because I left all my flashcards at school and then I didn't have any access to them. But you can use flashcards if you've got them or you can prepare slides if you don't have the materials available at home. Now for this final section, I'd just very quickly uh, like to talk about managing the class remotely. We know that keeping the attention of five to eight year olds for any extended period of time is always somewhat of a challenge even in the classroom. With this new situation, we've got the additional complication of environmental distraction. So first of all, make sure that you've prepared. Set up your computer next to a table where you can have your lesson plans and props close by. I give my classes here. I've got my computer in front of me. There's a little space for my lesson plan. And next to me, there's a desk where I have all my materials. Behind the desk is the box hidden away with all the things in it. So everything is ready. Make sure as well that you're ready digitally. You can see that I've, in this lesson, I was going to demonstrate floating and sinking. So I've already opened up the song that we were going to sing. I've got my video ready to show them. I've got the PowerPoint ready where we will be writing down the instructions and I've got my daily routine uh, PowerPoint where every day we write the date. So everything, everything is ready um, so that we don't have to waste time looking for things. Keep your lessons short. 30 minutes is more than enough time to keep everyone's attention during a video conference and make sure that the pace of the lesson is fast. You may find that you need more activities than you would do normally in the classroom, but that you change activity more frequently. Familiarity is also key in difficult circumstances. I always start off with the daily routine, as I would in class. We sing the song about the days of the week and the months of the year. Children know these songs and it helps them to feel comfortable and settle into the class. Review as much as possible. Progress can be slower as children aren't able to practice by talking to each other as they would in the classroom. Use plenty of songs, games, videos and stories to maintain interest and motivation. Make sure that you've got the microphones switched off. Teaching children in their own homes means that we have less control or no control at all over their environment. So ask them to mute their microphones. With this age group, it may take children some time to learn to mute and unmute their microphones. So make sure you sign in to your, uh, your platform, your video chat with your own session so that you can mute children and help them along uh, by muting any microphones that have been accidentally left on. Also, if there's a chat, try, if you can block the chat, then great, but ask the children not to use the chat. Older children will be able to use the chat box to answer questions or to um, even ask questions. But for this age group, it's more of a distraction than a useful tool. They'll start to send emojis and that'll be the end of it. So instead of typing yes or no into the chat box, encourage them to put thumbs up or down to answer yes or no. Some video conferencing tools such as Zoom, they also have a draw application, which I also recommend 
disabling before starting this session. We don't want children drawing all over our slides. Break up your session with short activities to keep everyone on their toes. Use one or two different ones to include in each session. You can just suddenly shout out, everybody, fly like a bird, jump like a frog. Don't forget to catch a fly. So that's it really for my suggestions for teaching younger learners remotely. And uh, now I'd be happy to answer any of your questions that you, that you may have for me. Hi Joe, can you hear me? Hopefully Mike has been uh, noting down. Somebody's just answered a question then, how do we deal with parental anxiety? Mm, well, that, that is a tricky one, but it's very important, I find, to have direct contact with those parents. So I've got three groups of parents, one for each of my three classes, and I can speak to the parents directly and try to reassure them. And of course, the parents attend these classes in large part. You, you can see the parents sitting next to the, to the children. Um, sometimes you can hear them actually whispering the answers. So parents are there, they're joining in. Sometimes they say, oh, I, I don't know a lot of English. And um, I just try to make light of it, joke with them. Well, you know, you're learning a lot through these online lessons. Hi, Joe. Can you hear me? Yes. Can so, um, thank you. I have indeed been writing down lots of questions, but um, a huge um, thank you to you for an amazing session. It's been great. Uh, amidst all the questions, just so many comments saying how much people have enjoyed um, today's session. And um, probably people aren't aware, but we've got over 1,500 teachers with us right now live so thank you all for joining us and um i think we have to say i mean the the as well as yourself joe that the stars of the webinar have been these amazing kids that and, and we're very honored that you've shared the videos um with us so um lots of compliments for the kids um as well in the in the chat box i'll pass that on they'll be thrilled <laughs> and i have to say joe you must be um a great um, teacher because you did the the origami lesson and I was following it here. Would you like to see my attempt at the origami? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I didn't do this one. This is my hat. So I'm very, pr I'm very proud of my, my hat. So thank you um, very much. So lots of questions. One, and I, I, you touched on it in the webinar, but one that perhaps we can um, speak about again is um, these are young kids, they're sitting in front of a screen. What is the optimum amount of time for a lesson, do you think, in the current circumstances? Well, I would definitely say no longer than 30 minutes. Their attention span is, is more or less, um, that's, that's about right. Um, right at the beginning, we were given some freedom from the school to to give the classes as long as we wanted, but they just naturally fitted into a 30 minute slot. It's it's plenty. So definitely no longer. If you want to work on any worksheets or anything, the children can do those after the session. But I would say no longer than 30 minutes. OK, um, enjoy the webinar. You, you spoke about um how you start the lesson, um, what about finishing a lesson? What's your routines for finishing an online lesson? Well, at the end of the lesson, we always finish by saying bye-bye. Um, I have said that we have the children's microphones all on mute during the session, except for when any child wants to participate, they will switch them on individually. But at the end of the session, Everyone is allowed to put their microphone on at the same time and they can all say bye bye to each other. And they actually look forward to that so much that occasionally when I've made them 
a separate video and I've shown them the video and I've said bye-bye at the end of the video, they've all switched on their microphones and started to say bye-bye and say, no, it's not time. So they they very much enjoy just that moment of um, speaking to each other and, and saying bye-bye to each other. So we always do that at the end. I do turn the volume down a little bit though, just before. <laughs> and obviously it's a different experience from teaching in the classroom teaching online how do you differentiate so let's say you have some kids who are shy some kids who are hyperactive maybe some kids with educational needs how do you manage all of those uh, different um, needs in one online lesson well that's a tricky one um, what we do is uh, children that are particularly shy, um, some of them, they haven't found that they were able to switch their cameras on. So I have allowed them to participate in the sessions with their cameras off. And um, obviously there's been contact with the parents um, so that I know that they're there. I know that they're participating. And sometimes when they do want to say something, they've switched the microphone on and they've participated orally, but they've not wanted uh, other children to see them. So those children have been allowed to participate without the without the camera on. I've also got another child who um, he found the situation very, very stressful. And he said to his mum one day, he said, right, that's it. I'm not speaking English again at all until this is all over. And uh, we came to an agreement in discussion with the parent that uh, the child would be allowed to to write the answers down if he wanted to participate. So he usually writes, good morning, teacher, and he holds up his paper. So whenever I see him with the paper, um, I encourage him and name him so that he's still included in the lesson. And also any of the, the action games, he can join in those, but he doesn't actually want to speak. However, he does speak on the videos, so it's a case of um, trying to find a, a happy medium, but um, communication with the parents is key. Okay. Um, and one of the particular challenges of the current situation, I think, especially with young learners, is how do we go about practicing speaking because obviously when you've got them all in the classroom together that's a lot easier you can put them in pairs and put them in groups what about in this situation how are you helping them with uh, developing their speaking well that for me has been the most difficult part I and mean, you can see with this class when they're all there online there are 24 children in the class and i at the moment haven't found a way to get them to speak in pairs I know that there are some platforms that have breakout groups, and I think those are ideal for older children. Um, but I'd be very reluctant to send any of these monkeys off into um, a breakout room because I don't think that they would go ahead and do the activity. So what we've been doing is encouraging them to just put their hand up, um, unmute the microphone, uh, speak a little bit, take turns in speaking. And then um, with the videos, I've shown you, I showed you one of the videos where the children were doing the experiment. Well, what you've seen here is use of language that the, that the children learn over the whole period of time. Um, initially, we just introduced vocabulary, then we brought in a structure. Through these little videos and experiments that the children have been doing, they um, and they always start off with "Hello, teacher." So it's as if they're having a conversation directly with me. They're using the language that they've learned, so they're not having a conversation with someone. But I I do feel that they're directing these videos to me. I've also asked them to send in little videos of them reading, if we've been working on any particular sounds, to check the pronunciation. So the videos help and um, asking them to participate as well. I think we've maybe got time for one or two more questions. And as well as the speaking, I've noticed uh, this afternoon, afternoon a few questions about um, reading. How are you managing... Uh, uh, reading lessons or developing their reading in the current situation? Well, 
Um, again, that's a tricky area. Um, we, I teach, I use phonics when we're teaching and we were doing very, very well with our progression. We'd done all of the sounds and I would have, it, had we been in the classroom, I would have continued on with new sounds. So what I decided to do is put a little bit of a break on that and we are going over and practicing sounds that children already know. We read things together. I read and then I just say over to you and then I just, I watch them. Um, you can tell if they're reading because they're moving their mouth. So um, we try to do that. I also ask individuals to take over and read. Um, but the process is much, it's much slower because if I read it, who wants to read this? They then put their hand up, they've got to unmute, they read, we all read. So it's a little bit slower. So again, um, I've been putting some little stories onto a blog that children can access, read, and having the parents video them, that's been the main thing sending through these videos so that I can check with pronunciation. And that's great because if any of the words are being wrongly pronounced, then I just send a little audio back to each child, an individual audio. Wow, that was great. Alejandro, you're doing a fantastic job. Now listen to how we pronounce the word natural. So each one is getting individual feedback as well. Brilliant. Um, I see a few people in the chat box complimenting me on my great questions um but actually these are not my questions these are the questions that you have come up with i'm reading them from the chat box you're much more intelligent than i am so i can't take any credit for the questions i'm going to ask you one last question and that's um how about assessing the students so that maybe not so much in a formal way but how do we know that they're that they understand what we're teaching them that that, that, that they're following how are you managing that Yes, again, that's a that is a tricky one. Um, largely through watching, observation of the children in their participation when they're when they're there, who's participating, who's lively, who's got their hand up, um, is their participation correct? So a continuous um, assessment, really. I'm also using the videos, which has been a great help to assess everyone individually. Uh, but I did say before, there are some children that haven't put their camera on or perhaps haven't sent the videos through. So I'm having to make a balance between any participation that they're doing now and what I know that those children can produce throughout the year. So probably when I have to do the grades, there'll be um, some kind of an average. So continuous assessment, observation, using the videos. The parents do actually send through photos of any worksheets that the children have done. So there is quite a lot of toing and froing. Great. So Joe, I think we're we're working you very hard at the moment and I know you've got your own classes and your own students to look after. You, uh, you've prepared the videos for us and this is your second webinar today. So I think um, you deserve a break now. So I'm just going to say um, a huge thank you to you, Joe, on behalf of, of everyone at Macmillan Education for a fantastic session. Lots of um, great practical suggestions, lots of compliments in the chat box as well. And just to remind everyone, I've seen the question a few times, we record all of our webinars. So this session has been recorded and we will share the recording with you as soon as possible. Um, and if you haven't seen some of the other videos, you can check the recording. So we've had um, sessions on teaching um, teens and um, other sessions. Next week on the 27th, we have Russell Stannard, who is doing a whole webinar on um, assessment in remote teaching. How do we assess our students? And on the 3rd of June, we have a question and answer session with Tom Kiddle from Nile, all about um, how we teach online and how we develop as teachers in the current circumstances. Um, I'd also like to say a huge thank you to Federica. I know many of you are missing uh, Federica, who would normally host the webinars. Um, we're giving her a day off today. She deserves a break, um, but she'll be back 
um, next week. And, and she does so much work behind the scenes. So huge thank you to her. And Joe, I'm sure you'll join me in thanking all of the teachers. Um, you know, it's a real honor for us that, uh, especially now when, as well as teaching, you've got all your lives and your own children and everything else to manage, and you still um, manage to, um, you know, find an hour out of your busy schedule, sometimes very early in the morning, late at night to join us. So thank you so much. <laughs>